Hello, everyone. Here, Ulises Lavaroni for Cyclical Dreams. We have a great honor and pleasure to introduce you a new interview. This one will be with Steve Roach, a special guest today. And it's an honor for us to, to have you, Steve. Welcome. Thank you so much. And I was just sharing with you before we went live what a great honor it is for me to be part of your expanding community and to see and, and feel the, the growth of this music we love so much, you know, internationally expanding out. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you and your audience. Many thanks. So Thank for start, um, I want to talk about your, your musical vision, how, how change in, in time, I mean, which events you consider change your musical vision in your life? I mean, in your music, we can appreciate clearly different approaches. Uh, you will correct me, but I can distinguish minimalism and a kind of Berlin school approach in a way, but ambience influences too, but a really strong um, tribal influence of music, really earth world music and, how it happens, how, how those different things uh, found you. Right, well, that's, a, that's the perfect question that we could ask one question and I could answer it for the next hour and a half. So okay. we'll work You're with that. <laughs> and, um, but right, the, uh, for me, the, the promise of electronic music, what that offered from the very beginning uh, when I, discovered the, you know, my roots came from of the things that really inspired me was early progressive music of Yes and Pink Floyd and King Crimson and all of that. And, um, and inside of that music would be passages that I that were instrumental and that would really start, start to stretch out and expand and move into worlds that I was already feeling in my consciousness before music. It would be connected to where, where I grew up in Southern California and spending a lot of time in the deserts and out at the ocean and in the mountains. And sometimes all in one day, I would have that experience. So that kind of dynamic just from uh, as a young person growing up was something I was looking for in art and music that I could express those kind of feelings that arise in those kind of spaces. So, um, that, that sort of, that set the tone before even having my hands upon the instruments or even realizing I would be working with electronic music, but it was this craving to create and live in those spaces that you access when you're out, you know, away from linear time, you're out in, in an expanded sense of time, you're out in, a, you know, an expanded sense of awareness. So the, the music that I was always drawn to and then eventually the Berlin School that we call it now and then, and electronic music overall from, from Europe and from many of the countries in Europe I was listening to in the late 70s. Um, and that was form, forming you know, a new pathway into like all of these possibilities, plus minimalism, Terry Riley, Lamont Young, that sort of thing, I'm listening to that. At the same time, I'm Philip Glass, Steve Reich, that sort of thing. I saw many concerts by those guys early on, like all of the you know, 18 musicians and Einstein on the beach and all of that. And then mix that with the music of ECM, the, the ECM label, another piece that brings in, you know, a, a really valuable sense of tone and texture and time and um, space in music. But beyond all that, the, the aesthetic was being developed before hearing any music. And so I started hearing music that was externalizing so much of what I was feeling before I started doing music. I came to music a bit later in, in my life, about 18 years old, 19 years old. And so, um, you know, just being self-taught and just ultimately being able to put my hands on the synthesizers in the beginning was the big piece was to just start exploring and 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 not be have any real like you know I tried to, to to take some electronic music classes in college and it was happening so slow that I would still be there now with hardly I feel like having accomplished anything but satisfying certain uh, exercises by the teacher so it was really about just jumping into the deep end and just you know listening and learning and and just 
immersing in with as much time as you could possibly um, invest into that. So the styles that have emerged in my music, the, let's say the more than styles, but the, the realms that I work in that I'm drawn to, that promise that I mentioned early on, it felt like with synthesizers, electronic instruments combined with your imagination and a sense of giving yourself the freedom to just go and create on any particular day in a direction that might not be congruent with what you did yesterday connected to, but at the same time, it was, to me, it was really authentic to just being, having this kind of emotional, creative agility to move between all these worlds and, and, and be completely in this space, you know, be completely in a, in a sequencer driven mosaic of patterns and all of that, that that unlocks in your consciousness. And then the next day it's breathing, diaphanous, expansive chords from, you know, just being out in the desert over the weekend, for example, and I come back and I'm bringing in the desert sky and bringing in that sense of time slowing way down. And so that's where that's coming from. It's coming from that internal desire and from that's being activated out in the world. It's like, it's not purely born from being locked away in a studio and just, you know, not having a direct connection with what's happening, you know, in the world. So it's eventually, um, you know, that those different aspects of my music uh, continue to evolve, I would say, in equal proportion. The, 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 the sequencer driven melodic rhythmic type music, then the breathing diaphanous was a, a essential part of my connection to the sound current. And then eventually the connection I made through the, into Australia and with Dreamtime Return and those elements started bringing in the, uh, the, the rhythmic element that was not that was not pitched the way sequencer music is. So you have very defined melodic patterns that intertwine and create this mosaic that could almost be related to some classical music moving into deeper into this connection to the the uh, the more elemental aspects of earth and starting to study more about shamanistic practices in music and then um, indigenous forms of music and naturally my connection to Australia was very strong early on and so that was perhaps the most at that point up at 1987 when I traveled to Australia that was a pivotal moment for bringing everything I've just described to you together it brought some of the sequencer style that I was working in it brings in the breathing expansive it brings in the acoustic element with didgeridoo and shakers and some percussion and so all of that became um, unified on that album in a big way so I think that album for me was really up to that point and, and it remains uh, you know, a vital touchstone in the development of what I've created over these years. I can imagine, well, I'm, I am too a DJU player, so. Uh, Very good, yeah. yeah. And um, it changed you not in a musical aspect. I mean, it changed you, the playing, and uh, absolutely right so you 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 can you can feel in in minutes uh, that it's it's different your approach to sound because you are feeling different so i i can imagine go to australia di directly and and you have a, co a a connection with with the painting too and i saw many many graphics on on your work about the, the Australian painting and those minimalism and the way that that do the thing. So I can imagine that it's, a, it's an absolutely changing uh, of, of, the, of the view that is really different, like being the lab with the modulars, I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really, um, again, that connection to being outside of the studio and bringing in those different aspects in has really been an ongoing theme for me. And, and at the same time, I can have days where I come in and have what like a tabula rasa state, this this you know blank slate mind, and come into the instruments and just let yourself be there too, where you're just 
one of, you know, rather than a big agenda or a plan or uh, something that you're mapping out from some big adventure that just happened or that you're tapping into, but you're just in the moment. We, we all know as electronic musicians how that is a really powerful adventure in itself. It's like, you know, having this ability to go and take a hike somewhere, but you don't even, you don't know where you're going and you have no sense of what, what's coming ahead, what kind of weather, if the trail is dangerous or if it's challenging. So those kind of metaphors for me work in the studio here beautifully because you can just step off and then the instruments will start, there will be some kind of like a symbiotic experience that we where they start to connect with us and then we're connecting back to them and then their whole thing starts spiraling and then sometimes within moments you're hearing something back that's fully developed and and completely like realized and amazing in that moment so there's also that piece too that it's that's equally important for for me and my process to just have a time where you're you're letting all of this just emerge and, and come up without having a sense of like you have to over direct it or overthink it but, and of course that happens after you have your relationship with the instruments established. You need to learn and know all the details and subtleties of all, of the, of all these amazing tools that we have now. But, uh, yeah. but sometimes I'll get a new, a new synth and as soon as I fire it up before uh, you know, I'm trying it out and there it is within five minutes, there's an amazing something coming out that's way, way advanced from what I know about the machine. And then, then after that initial contact with it then you settle in and, and start to really you know develop the understanding of it but that's that's the beauty of having for me also hardware I'm really a hardware guy and I saw your studio quickly there you have instruments and knobs and keys and sliders and the, you know all of that so that's a really big piece for for how I work essential hardware yeah yeah so it's it's, it's really really related with with what I'm supposed to go into ask you is about your method. It's um, something that you just described. It. It's about um, a kind of personal inner alchemy of, of, of one part, one, one thinking part, the composer and the, the improvisation is just, just, just go. It's about that. So, so you mix. So when, when, you, when you start to work, you you always mix those things or it's by it's by periods or by ab albums maybe you you if you do you plan like okay i want to make an album more um planned and one absolutely improvisation or it's it's just one word one one way of work that you mix all the things in in your experience and and the work came just right. Yeah, it's, I would say that there's certain albums that, or projects, let's say, or or just before they even become albums or projects, they're just directions I want I want to go explore, and and start creating and drawing uh, from that pool of inspiration. Or, for example, when I w finally was able to get the big dot com large format Moog modular system style, the Moog style modulars, synthesizer.com and a lot of other modules in there in the large format. And then I have the Eurorack and I've been playing with Eurorack since it was first coming into the United States in the 90s and and really watched that whole thing grow. But the, but the, the .com, when I built that system, that really, for me, set the course for a very specific kind of music that was first presented on skeleton keys, where it was, you know, that that quality of certainly there's the the Berlin school roots, but because I've been working in that music style so long, there's like a whole realm that has evolved in the way that I approach it, and and of course the musical influences, but just the pathways that open up, you know, in your compositional consciousness and in your you know the, the it's like an architecture of the soul that you tap into, and so in that case I'll just be generating pieces, just staying in that space and working in that sequential mode. And that's what you'll hear in the series of albums that would be started with skeleton keys and then um, um, spiral revelation and spiral meditation and then bloom ascension and 
um, Tomorrow, the most recent album, and then my live concerts now that you're, perhaps you've seen some of those on, on YouTube that my recent live concerts from the time room since we're in our uh, non-travel mode here with the pandemic. So, um, but it, 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 and often though, it's like the, that whole momentum and that way of combining and blending that we talked about earlier will, especially if I'm presenting a concert, will we'll merge into there and I'll use and carve and sculpt this, these kind of journeys using the different stylistic realms that I work in and, and then, but build it from a programmatic where I'm really telling a story and, and it's like whatever it takes in that set and whatever the music takes, you know, I mean, of course, we're now we're talking about the live from my time house, but when playing live for all these years going out, taking didgeridoo, I mean, the first time I played didgeridoo at Klimdog in 91 in Holland in the Netherlands, there, um, you know, this did, I brought the didgeridoo in and that was, I mean, it was kind of baffling to people. What's, what, what's this about, you know, play this wooden thing and then you've got an Oberheim expander over here, you know. So bridging those worlds has always um, sonically been really natural to me, but you know, I love that sense of time as well to where you're taking a, a, a basically a tree log and creating this drone, incredible, powerful music where right next to an Oberheim expander or, you know, some kind of beautiful analog synth. So you're, you're reaching the same place together. So again, in the, in the process of building the music, uh, it's just the, the, the instruments, that interface that you have with them, uh, it just continues to build momentum. And there, there isn't a specific, um, I would say, formula to anything that I do. It's really about just being really present with it each day and feeling where I want to go with it. And at certain points, I mean, I, I also play my own style of ambient guitar, electric guitar, where I'm looping and half speeding and creating textures with that. So again, it's like, as an artist uh, in the visual medium, medium, and let's say rather than limit yourself to just one kind of paint, I may have a whole variety of paints. I may be working in metal. I have wood over here. I have some synthetic textures, you know, some sort of uh, carbon fiber material. I have all these different visceral forms that I draw into the music to then activate that, you know, our, our ears and our consciousness we, to hear all, when you hear those things combined together, the acoustic, the electric, and the more surreal use of all of that together by sampling and resampling and transposing down two or three octaves and combining different things together. I do, a, I love to do those kind of composite recordings in that way as well. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg there in that process, but that's a great question. Great. And well, you, you collaborate so much with a load of musicians, so much. Uh, a, a large list of names, Robert Rich, Michael Cerns, of course, Vidna uh, uh, Jorge Reyes, Eric Vuelo, Serena Gabriel, Robert Lugan, Byron Metcalf, and many, 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 many more. So when, when you collaborate with, some, with someone, you decide to have a specific role. It depends on the collaboration. You have always the same place and you act with different people. How, how is for you collaboration? Yeah, another great question there. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, again, it's like uh, you're, you're you you enter into a, a space with with a with a colleague with a, with a collaborator, and if we're like with Robert or with Michael, I would say my most recent collaboration with uh, well, the the recent collaboration with with Michael is that we have you know a very similar set of um, of approaches to how we work. And we have the, the wide variety of, of synths. And sometimes we have a lot, of, sometimes the same synths. We're both working in modular. Uh, we have the acoustic element we bring in. Although, you know, Michael, I would say right now is more focused electronically. And then he has the beam and of course the guitar. But those, those 
kind of collaborations with electronic uh, peers like Robert and Eric. And of course he's got, he has the guitar thing happening more. Uh, that piece sets a, a certain direction out that's obvious. But when we're, when I'm working with artists that where we're working with similar uh, palette, then it's really the music starts forming from us working together. And I really, you know, I've had a certain amount of collaborations where we're, we're not in the same room together, but we're tuning into each other's aesthetic and we're creating zones and whatever kind of pieces. And then we'll be sending those back and forth. But uh, the collaborations that really, um, well, I think the ones that, that really speak deep are, and everybody you've mentioned, we've been in the same room together working. We're breathing the same air. We're having meals, we're talking, we're comparing notes. When I first met Jorge and Suso and of Suspended Memories, we had exactly almost the same CD collection at that time, all three of us from three different places in the world. So we had those touchstones, you know, David Sylvian and a lot of the early electronic stuff and ECM. And just, so it's cool when you find those commonalities and, and similar with Robert, uh, with Michael and um, and then something like a collaboration with Byron Metcalf, where he's really strictly focused on his percussion and rhythmic worlds. So that becomes really that kind of collaboration. Like we're we're working and finishing one right now, and that has such a, a you know a dynamic to it where he's really the the, the craftsman you know sculpting out these rhythmic worlds which I certainly can do. And sometimes our collaborations will, might start with me creating a, a, a rhythmic trance groove on, on all of my combination of drum machines and, and analog um, sequencers that I can take into a more tribal kind of tuning where that's not so sequential, the tones aren't so melodic, they're more percussive and tuned to certain drum sounds. Uh, but in, in Byron's case, he'll start generating these, you know, an amazing collection of groove like groove scapes and then I'll take those groove scapes and then I'll start carving and working from an atmospheric or a chordal harmonic kind of place against those rhythms so that's how that kind of formation will take so and then we've also you know been in the same room a lot and played concerts you know for years together so we have that foundation so uh, my most recent uh, collaboration with Serena Gabriel a woman from Tucson who's um, just really bringing this beautiful acoustic aspect into the into our collaboration together, as well as she's an electronic um, artist and is working with you know all the tools that we're all working with. So uh, that's a really exciting collaboration right now because of her just her sensibilities from the way she hears, the way she builds her music is really unique in its way. And so we started out where I was helping her in a mentorship program and, and um, you know, learning about teaching her about, you know, recording. And of course she's drawn to hardware equipment. So that was the prerequisite when we met up around this idea. And, and she has been performing around in Tucson for years and, and beyond. But plays didgeridoo, plays lyre, plays harmonium. Harmonium is really a, a big piece in her music. It's really like the soul sound. So um, that element has been in our uh, in these collaborations that we've been doing. There's three now, um, and uh, Nectar Meditation and An Honest Dream, which was centered around her solo work, and then Temple of the Melting Dawn, which just released. And I'll make sure that you get a copy of that if you haven't heard it. But uh, again, that's a, a new direction and bringing in this, again, her, her connection to the, these very particular acoustic instruments that she's really bonded with and connected with is, is uh, just brought a whole other voice in there. And in the same way that working with Jorge, working with Robert, working with Michael, and Robert Logan, all of, the, all of these collaborators, there's always some sort of realm that you discover together and then you start building a language together. And it becomes over over years, it becomes more, I mean, I'm understanding it deeper and more um, articulately about how that language can be very quickly um, developed and uh, emphasizing certain 
aspects of this language you're creating and then certain parts of that relationship are become really like you know i know when we bring out like with serena the the uh you know i bring in the expander and then just the combination of her you know instruments are just going to create like this kind of alchemy and the harmonium is is really that 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 sort of breathing it's, it has a keyboard element but it's there's a breathing aspect to it because you have to play it with by breathing it and and so that part there connects to my lifelong connection to the aspect of chords breathing structures from silence space so that that's an important piece there and the same piece like with byron when you're playing percussion and it's not all on a drum machine there's heartbeat there's space there's a physicality that gets brought into the music. So the physicality that gets brought in is really, really a vital infusion to, you know, what I discovered early on all the way, well, back with Origins, the album Origins and Artifacts and those are early tribal, more tribally um, infused ambient sort of spaces, how I was bringing in breath, bringing in physical movement. Um, Jorge was a guest on Origins and, um, having his playing the, the cantaros, the water, the clay water pots, and then the breathing, chanting sort of thing in there. So, you know, all of that just continues to uh, inform the, each process. So every, each collaboration, each uh, album just takes on a life and a language of its own. And over time, if the collaborations have enough energy to sustain, then that's where you can go further and deeper over time. I mean, I could, you know, there's a run with Fidna of Mana, you know, amazing albums that we created together and created those sometimes in Europe or we when were playing at a festival in Philadelphia and we took all the furniture out of the, out of the hotel room. It was a pretty big suite that we had and we took and moved it all out on the patio and set everything up in the room and, the, and we just recorded an album for a week in a hotel room, uh, you know, on like the sixth floor in Chinatown in Philadelphia. And that's, that's sort of being in that kind of world where you're not familiar with your environment is very cool, you know, and you're just, you're finding new restaurants and then you're hanging out and working late at night. You're in some anonymous room somewhere. All of that is a very, very um, powerful contribution to the creative process. So you get out of your familiar surroundings and you put yourself in places where it's, it's maybe uncomfortable or it's challenging or there's other aspects that come through that, that will come through the music that will bring this quality of music out of you deeper because of wanting to find a deeper sense of connection to something that's grounding you and giving you this feeling of safety and comfort if you're in a place that's maybe a little bit suspect. So that's one another sideband. Yes, that's that, that's great, and, and it's very interesting what you say about it's like preserve uh, different kind of languages in each collaboration. So, and and you talk about well, you mention a lot of uh, um, instruments that belongs to very old traditions. So the next next thing. I don't know if it's a question, but it will be interest, interesting your view about. I, because it let me think, I remember how Jung Hassel established the idea of fourth world, you know, the combining of really tribal information with really high tech stuff. And like jumping, uh, all the classical, history is like go go thousand years ago and take all the very best that is still today mm -hmm. and go directly directly to the machines to the very weird part of the machines so i and i think well it's the same school but cherry riley also focus on that he, he he go to india to to find something different that it was not in the contemporary music in Europe, you know, he 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 bring again the tonality to the experimental music. So it's very interesting what happened when you when you are going like an, an avant-garde um, way, but you rescue something that you consider very very 
val valuable from the past or maybe from the old traditions that are of course on present day. So I think you have your personal and for sure very experienced vision about this, about how do you take all those drum rhythms that are not perfect. You know, you know about that. It's, tuck, yeah. tuck. it's all, and all this stuff that, that is really very important to preserve. And do you think that uh, one way of preserve this is insert in new music? Certainly, I think that um, to just to do just take take just the indigenous inspirations and music that you're speaking of and taking for your for your own um, what what you're drawn to and uh, and like when I first met David Hudson from Australia, I produced and recorded what was a didgeridoo solo album first one i think on cd at that time and and whenever that was in the, in the early 90s so that in itself presents that instrument you know almost in a in a presentation uh, where, where it's a uh, ethnomusicology kind of study just by itself and how it's played and that sort of thing but then you realize the power of just these instruments of all these certain acoustic instruments that have this voice and they have this way of transporting you. And it just, it became really obvious to me that it was that, you know, in the way that I, I want to use them, I don't want to say, um, you know, I'm thinking about using them in, in a way that's, that's predetermined or that is like, I'm not honoring its traditional use. I mean, I'm just using it in a way that fits in to my music as a, as a timbre and as a, piece that like the didgeridoo for example was so as as you know from playing it and then the way it combines so perfectly with electronic music it almost feels like a this ancient electronic drone you know electronic instrument so when that started to enter into the music and then when you bring in that organic piece you're talking about with percussion you're, you you can have maybe a basic kind of track that's electronic that's that's almost like a metronome but you're playing the hand percussion around it you're playing shakers you're, you know, I have stones in there, the, the rocks, that sort of stuff. So you're bringing, you're bringing atmosphere, and even you know, you're having open mic in in your in 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 so to speak in in this world. If it's only synthesizers and electronic, there's potentially there's no atmosphere in terms of the natural world in there. I mean, even having an open mic playing a few things in a space, you're going to get that kind of atmosphere that gets infused into the electronic landscape. So I heard that response or that result early on was the, the fact that you could take these different instruments, combine them, again, processing and emphasizing their organic uh, imperfect nature and having that against transposed against what could be, some, you know, you could certainly program uh, imperfections and random organic qualities in electronic music, um, you know, from, from the very beginning. And nowadays with a lot of the new modules coming, there's amazingly sophisticated pieces in there for creating um, extreme control over subtle random uh, changes and nuance that you would hear um, like in Terry Riley's music, for example, or John Hassel's music, which both, are, you know, John Hassel is like amazing. I mean, to me, that's you know, and I've, I've met John, I've spent time with John and had the honor of hanging out with him and, and um, in, a few, in several situations. And he came to my studio house and when I lived in, in uh, Venice, in Los Angeles. And so it got, you know, I was able to get a sense of some of that, um, some of that approach from hang, hanging with John. So, uh, but that quality of bringing that into the music consciously and having you know, the ability to do micro tweaking on the electronics and then apply that philosophy back over to the organic is big. And so in, in many tracks, uh, I would say, I, you know, especially with Vidna Mana and, and working with Jorge and Suso or my, those, the albums that, well, even more recently would be Trans Archaeology, which really was about tracing what we're talking about here. It's like going back in my own 
the genealogy of my own music and drawing these different aspects of from certain albums and, and almost treating it like I went to an archaeological dig of, of one of my studios in, in 400 years and I came back to my studio and here, oh, here's the time room and I started excavating with a shovel and we're like digging down and then we're finding you know, uh, SD cards that are still able to play. And then you get that card and then you play it and then you extract some element of it, which would be like, there's some elements with Jorge. I wanted to have Jorge's sonic spirit with me there. So I found some outtake mixes or whatever they were, some sort of, uh, they were actually uh, just extended pieces that I had released on an album, but it was, it, it went beyond the timeline that we needed. So I found those pieces and then Kind of uh, melted it down and made it into like almost like a shards of of something you'd find in pottery or something like you know that kind of piece. So that that you know that bringing that kind of ultra organic quality inside of the music has always been very very compelling to me. And and just that metaphor I used about the archaeology sonic archaeology has been a theme. I mean, well before I was a musician and early as a younger as a young guy, um, that desire to be an archaeologist, I think, was one of my first impulses was to travel back in time and put pieces together. So that it, it's now I'm just actually, as I'm speaking with you, feeling that bridge there, how, how that's occurred in, in my music through this, this way of, of extracting and, and blending and just creating this labyrinth of worlds from all these different times and textures and and uh, telling that story of life, you know, of, of the expanded sense of, of life and the awareness of what that means to each of us as an, as an artist and as a person being alive here on the planet. That's a great commitment in your music about all of this. It's very, very, very beautiful. And, Thank you. Um, well, I will ask you about um, this is a, uh, two questions. Maybe they are out of of those big subjects that we were uh, talking about. Um, uh, one is about Soundquest. Uh, it's a it's an incredible festival, and you you start to to go. Uh, like a, a, a gravity uh, about a lot of musicians that are very interesting. Um, and the last one, I think, uh, but because it, it was on pandemia, it's many people in the world were in the houses looking to those beautiful concerts of many high quality artists. And it was really beautiful. And it was for free for the people. It was very interesting, very valuable all of these and how is for you uh, like to to coordinate all of this it's, it's a great it's a great job you know well thank you well it's uh, it's still resonating in myself and in the the team that we work together to pull this off and i'll, I'll talk about them in a bit but um right well the momentum was building for SoundQuest Fest before pandemic. And uh, the first one was already 10 years ago and, and with Eric Wallow and Lauren Norell and Byron Metcalf and Mark Selig, Eric Wallow. And it was in real time and it was in Tucson. And that, you know, I was building that momentum towards that for years and having played in festivals all over the world, uh, uh, with Jorge, some great festivals with Jorge, a couple of those in Mexico City, playing in, you know, in Europe at festivals and Lanzarote and the Canary Islands and Germany and Netherlands. Of course, the Klim, the Klim dog days back in the, in, in the 90s were, you know, 4,000 4, people coming to those electronic concerts. Klaus Schultz showing up as in, the, you know, to, to watch. And um, so in any case, this 10 year span just, it, it happened so quickly that uh, one thing to the next and more other concerts and albums. And then I was playing a string of dates in Tucson in a smaller venue that was a lot, just, it was more spontaneous and a bit easier to like manage those concerts while I was doing other larger shows. 
um, and I really wasn't ready to commit to the big production that it would take for SoundQuest Fest 2019, let's say, before right before the, the COVID hit the fan, you know. So um, then uh, I would say that like uh, the, the direction was getting close. I had Michael, I was get, getting ready for, to bring Michael in live and Robert, myself, and I was looking around at some other artists and, and then this thing happened. So it was like, at that point, then uh, I started doing um, these live streaming concerts from the time room. I was getting ready to fly out to New York City like three days before it was shut down. And I was had a what was looking like a sold out concert at St. George's Cathedral in Manhattan with the Ambient Church series uh, where I just played in LA a couple about six months earlier. Um, fantastic environment, you know, in a large cathedral, that sort of thing. So that that canceled out and the momentum was just like moving and but there was no way to then perform at that point so then in uh, my collaborations with Serena Gabriel she's uh, very you know thinking forward and and really um, doing a lot of posting of concerts and presenting her work in you know, online so she had really the uh, you know the, the real support of, of for me to like start streaming some solo concerts and she was had this the, the ability to film and to uh, video and then to edit and so the first few of those we did really just by the seat of our pants it was just these live streaming concerts and just learning as we go and very intense really super high stress I mean just like you know just so like you're walking a tight wire across the Grand Canyon and it's then it happens and so there's that kind of exhilaration so there's a, a bit of that exhilaration now after SoundQuest Fest, the, um, the one we just presented for three days. So, um, but we had such help with that. And so we, Serena continued to produce the live concerts with me. And then um, we were talking about, you know, I was talking about, I can't wait to get out and do SoundQuest Fest back in the world again. And, and then it was just like a natural impulse where she's like, well, of course we should do that, you know. So let's let's move into that for, for uh, in, you know, and of course we're, we have this kind of um, jump off and then figure it out as you're falling kind of attitude, you know, or approach to that sort of thing. So fortunately, um, I'm, you know, we have the support of, of uh, Eric Freeman who designed my early, the, the, I have four immersion apps for the iPhone and he designed those 10 years ago and those premiered at the SoundQuest Fest back way back when. So he's, uh, he, he's deep in the, in the, in the uh, world of, of um, production for, for um, online technology. And um, he's actually set up and worked with, with Disney Corp, you know, the Disney Corporation and set up their whole online presentation for years. He set that up and he's worked in television and he just and he and his partner um, um, Danny uh, who goes under uh, um, Morrow Vision I think it is but anyway they com they combine their efforts together and they were the guys that that when we approached them with the plan of what we were thinking and had it mapped out like three days four artists a day Time Room TV in the, for an hour in the beginning. It, start, it started out a bit more humble than that. And then it's, they signed on. They said, well, we can help support this kind of incredibly ambitious, you know, really not been done before programming where it starts at four o'clock on Friday. And they, you know, they built the whole, I mean, the, as we all know, I mean, some people didn't realize the concerts were were pre-recorded and built, but I mean, that, that's the only way that this could happen. You could not stream and do what we did. You probably could, but I mean, you, you, I don't know who would be left standing after that. You know, you'd be in the hospital with a heart attack or something, you know, and plus the coordination, but it, you know, I put the call out. So essentially once Danny and uh, and Eric were on board and and we discussed the, what it was gonna take, you know, with the, the background to build this piece and the, then we just set the, you know, the course 
for the for the timing of it. Um, and Serena and I set up the, the sort of each day scheduling, and then started thinking about artists. Of course, I you know know artists from years of, of what I've been doing. So there's certain artists that I could call right into and, and get those guys, you know, they were, everybody was all ready to sign up right on the moment there. And then Serena had connections to some very talented um, unknown art, lesser known artists. And so we brought that aspect in, which is really important. And so at that point, we just put the call out. We had the parameters, you know, we need a 30 minute set. It has to be recorded in this, in this format. It has to be delivered on this date. And then it just started to methodically build. Then uh, Eric and them, you know, then, then the, it really stepped up and I realized, I mean, there were certain days where I would get up at 8.30 in the morning and work till sometimes four or five in the morning, get back up again. Then I'd be doing a, a Zoom interview like we're doing for Time Room TV with Michael. And I just like got out of the shower and I'm just, I've been up like, you know, I had like two and a half hours sleep, you know, that sort of thing. So it was, there was a bit of a soul sacrifice, which I would do all over again, uh, at least in my mind. But now um, we have the opportunity to go to the next level with it. Um, uh, the spot, one of the main sponsors with us was uh, this, um, well, Nelda, TV and um, Nelda ya Buckman has been very supportive in uh, behind the scenes and helping fund the what's happening here. And we have a great list of sponsors there that I, I really don't want to leave anybody out. So I'm going to ask anyone watching here to go to the SoundQuest Fest um, 2021 website. And you'll see it's all, everything is still there if you missed it. And you can see the whole presentation. And from there, of course, all the concerts are up at, at my Steve Roach official YouTube page. So, um, but it was, uh, the challenges behind the scenes were immense. And uh, just in terms of having programming, these guys wanted it to be, they, it, I mean, they're working in network television, they build playlists, they build you know, all these things where there's no wondering, second guessing or tight wire like, Oh my God, what if this goes down, what's going to happen? You know, so they built it in such a way to where the timing, when they started it at four o'clock Arizona time, it ran straight through all the way, ultimately till, I mean, it went into the immersion zone, which was um, my channel that I have that just has long form, long form pieces running 24 seven now. So we would use that after the concerts each night to play straight through into the next day. So, but after the whole festival was over, there was still 40 or 50 people in the chat room, just nobody was leaving. They didn't want to go home, you know? So then they, it just stayed. And ultimately there was by Tuesday, we finally shifted it back over, you know, to the, when we started putting the concerts up on YouTube uh, as pre, as individual concerts. So um, that programming was amazing. So we also, for just on a techno technical point of view, there was those that the full weekend was synchronized to a to, to an exact duplicate of itself, so that it any went down. So yeah, the whole um, weekend was actually running on a backup server as well. So at, at any point, if so, if the main broadcast was going down of SoundQuest Fest, then then Eric could just switch over instantly. So that, that was also a really big piece that w w was vital because I mean, we, we really put, you know, everyone put so much into it and the energy that it took and the planning and the timing. And we just, we could not take a chance and rely just on one version of it. So that the entire uh, three days built in one continuous you know, playlist. It took, I think, 12, 11, 10 hours to, to upload to a second server. So we were testing out the, the whole festival for a week before, you know, nonstop. It was running 24 seven for, well, like maybe almost a week and a half of just so we could see what was happening there and with the, the DJ videos and to making sure that those all were getting cleared through YouTube. Because uh, if you have something in there that triggers the the copyright robots, then it'll shut down, you know, what's happening. So all that stuff, you know, was immense to, to, to consider. And we, and everyone, I mean, we just learned so much. So we just, 
learned so, so much through that whole process. And now we have the schematic built and, um, you know, we're looking at next year, um, of course, and that one in, in just, you know, thinking forward and looking at that as being a virtual streaming and live event. So hopefully if we can get out live, we'll combine the two together, have that piece going. So in the meantime, uh, I'm, I'm going to continue a, a one night event for a few times this year, and it'll be called Electro Bloom series. And Electro Bloom uh, was a series I started in Tucson that was, in a way, it was kind of building up to what happened with SoundQuest Fest. And the last Electro Bloom that happened was February, like the 15th or of, of right before a uh, pandemic took over. And that night, uh, Serena Gabriel played and a very cool group from Tucson, Basic Biology. And then I uh, played that evening as well. So that was the last live show that occurred. And so now we're gonna pick up with Electro Bloom and uh, have a one night version of what you saw with SoundQuest Fest. So we have an, an hour of Time Room TV where I'll be interviewing uh, artists and playing music videos and studio tours and short, um, you know, interest pieces um, of all kinds um, that moves, you know, into deeper into some of the technology or the philosophy or the, the creative uh, strategies around just art itself. I mean, just, I mean, I really want to explore and expand the time room TV concept um, as well. So that'll be uh, part of Electro Bloom for an hour, then there'll be four artists and then it'll be into the immersion zone, which is my 24 seven zone. So that we're, we're starting to uh, get that tooled up now for, uh, for the summer to have that one night event like that and have a few of those and keep the momentum building and keep the opportunities building for artists um, like around the world now and, and be featuring, you know, and using the, the uh, audience that we're building and tapping into to, you know, keep it, keep it really growing and exciting and, and vital and supportive of the world community. This is a, such a great thing, and I think all the community enjoy a lot of this work because it's it's a really big, big festival, and and well, you have a lot of things to do <laughs> coming, so you are very busy, and in the best way is to not just to make your own stuff, but you are sharing a lot, and this is so appreciated. Well, I very much appreciate that. And I've had such, uh, such support and such generosity from, from colleagues and, and folks along the way that have helped me in so many ways. And my desire to give back is really um, a big piece that drives this. And, and the team that we have now is, it's just really something. I mean, when you get that that team of people where we were just there and, and just doing whatever it takes to, to make something happen at this level. So again, the, you know, Serena Gabriel and Eric Freeman and Danny, and that's our main core right there. And then Nate Youngblood running behind the scenes, a lot of the web stuff. Um, and then of course, Sam Rosenthal at Project, he was one of the sponsors, Spotted Peccary, we had uh, Moog, the Moog Synth Company in there and Sequential Circuits. Those guys helped out with, you know, spreading the word and all. But, um, we're, you know, again, we're learning a lot. We're, we're just retooling and seeing what, what needs to happen for next time. But, I, again, the, uh, I can just see the, the need for it more than ever right now. And I think that, you know, with where, what we're living through right now in this completely unique time, and how it's hit the reset button for us in so many ways as how, how we were living our life before and now. And the, I mean, it's, there's, of course the loss is, is horrific. And then, and then, and then at the same time, the loss of life and what's the quality of life and how that's changed. But I think we're, we're adapting and figuring and finding ways to 
find the light and and the positivity and the and the and the quality of connection here. We need to be connected through um, what we love together, through the music and through the gathering. And you could see from Southwest Fest, the chat was just blowing up. It was just incredible that community. I mean, if that many people were talking during one of my shows, I don't know if I could keep playing, you know, but I mean, that when they were at any one of the concerts, there was a, a, I think hundreds of people all there, you know, watching the concert, commenting on it, sharing, talking, telling stories all the time while the concert is playing. So you've got this whole other level of engagement. And I know quite a few people just when the concert started, they shut the chat down and they watched the concert. But I also recognize very much the value of having that, that room where people could talk and still watch the concerts, kind of like in, 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 I'm sure in your concert halls, they have those the rooms where folks go with their babies during a concert so they can talk and feed the baby and all that stuff. And so in this case, we had like the, that room where all that noise and all that chatter and all that interchange and all that love and passion and stories and all that stuff was going on. So that was really equally as important, I feel, as everything that happened, you know, was that connection and, and people from all over the world. I saw, you know, just an amazing list of countries being represented from folks dropping in and and of course, now all those concerts live on forever on YouTube and we can, you know, visit and re-experience in any number of ways on our phone or on a, you know, wall-sized flat screen or yes, all of it. Absolutely huge ar archive of, of music. Yeah, it is and, and our archival moment in time here. And it really like steps into, you know, the full range from, from a guy, uh, with the vape pipe and, and, and his modular doing this really beautiful sound world to, you know, what we saw with Michael and his massive, you know, incredible studio and everything in between, you know? So it was really, truly like, that's a great way. It's an archival view at this moment. If you look at this in 15 years or in 50 years or something, it's, it has that quality of, of a big overview, you know, of, 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 technology and and just the music itself and the full range and yes and, and the way that everyone start to interact all the interaction yeah. that is in some in some ways really new yeah it is and it was fascinating how i mean we built the set just the the flow of artists was just a real sort of a feeling you know it was based on just intuition and moving sort of chess players around on the board, maybe this here, but it, it came together pretty quickly in how we put the flow together, um, Serena and I. And so, and then what was really cool was when then one set would kind of set itself up for the next set, just without any plan, you know, that, but it had this feeling like there was a momentum and then this kind of graceful segue between pieces or something that was more dramatic and then the next one would kind of grow out of that so there's just that kind of thing that that, that just happened that we were all just witnessing you know magically as it was happening and when it finally was finally going so but uh, i think we'll see more of those you know happening i mean i don't think i don't have a sense that we're out of the woods yet with this whole deal so you know with the pandemic and it's going to take time before people really feel comfortable to be in large gatherings uh, when they're not in a, some kind of, you know. It's a process and, and music is one of the, our best for, for that process, for sure. Right. For so sure. yeah, I mean, outdoor, you know, maybe outdoor concerts, could that, that's a great thing to consider because of, you know, what just what happens right now when we can be outside, so. So do you, is your group down there playing live out in, in your areas there? Is there live stuff happening? Not now, not now. Mm -hmm. There was a, a little space in the summer. Now we are on Altman. And that was a little space in summer that several gigs appears, but no, yeah. not, not yet. We have and I guess I should reframe that. I, I was already, but I mean, in, let's say in general, before like pandemic, were you, was there live stuff happening with your community there before we were locked down? 
yes, there's, uh, uh, it's, it's everything is changing with this. Right. Everything is changing. Right. People go to the machines. And right. The, the, the viewers, uh, the, there was an increase in viewers and, and the music, um, the, the music playings in, on the web were more and more and more. And the streaming, yeah. the streamings were, this is the, the year, you know, all the pandemia is all the, the, the streaming time. So, yeah. and it's absolutely different because uh, as musicians, we can play with all, all our instruments in the studio and on our, our configuration and, you know, very well go to stage. It's just a plan. You have a time, you have uh, some, you know, it's always changing and you have a kind of um, a reduced version of what you have on your studio and this is the time that all musicians are spreading their ideas uh, in 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 at home and it's very interesting too it's like go to different um, cooking spaces and and see what happened and this is very very this is different maybe it's not yeah. what what we were looking for but we have to we have to enjoy in the way that we can do many things better. And, and I completely and agree with that. Kissed, I think is one of this uh, really absolutely th this this last one was an explosion of, of viewers and everything. And what happened in each home, I, I, I know people that was with projectors at uh, on a wall looking for the characters <laughs> and things like that is. is it's just really beautiful, and so I. Right, and uh, I mean, I would, I would, for me, it's safe to say if 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 this did not have happened, you know, I was heading off to New York, and I was stressing on all the gear I was going to fly there. Am I how am I going to get my modular? And you know, I mean, I've flown my gear around the world for years. I mean, you know, all this stuff into South America and Europe and everywhere, but. This time around, it just felt even more stressful because of how flying is before the pandemic, you know. So when the when it when it got shut down, then it then that whole just what you said, where you have like your complete laboratory sitting there, and you just can go in and have it so dialed in, so finely tuned. All you know, at the last minute, I'm bringing in another instrument, bringing that in. That I mean, that's that's the beauty of what we're learning. What we're gaining from this time now where we've hit that reset button and when we go back out live that'll be interesting to see what choices are made then because we now have the option to have like the ultimate studio transmission and then for me I've been trying to reduce my setup I mean I remember like 35 years ago after a concert at two in the morning at a diner after storm warning concert I'm with my friends Lauren Norell was sitting there it's like I've got to get this stuff reduce down in size of it because it would take an army to help me build it up and take it down and load it up and when you see my Pasadena concert from uh, the Sky Opens concert I mean I had everything that you see in my concerts at SoundQuest Fest was on that stage I had a, a complete separate setup out front with an Oberheim OB8 to play structures I had the full modular I had a 32 channel soundcraft board I had my classic you know stack of expander and wave station and emu sampler and all you know the tools i've been using for 35 40 years it's still that important to me to where i have to take those out live that's my voice but i'm also thinking there's a there is a new way you know i'll find it and i'm looking to set up the new system now in, in a in a what i'm calling the new live room that that used to be the live room and now it's the streaming room. That's officially it's space now. So then the new live room will I'll start building that up with this aesthetic. So when the, when the cloud lifts, then I'll have this system that's gonna be a lot easier, but still really in, fully engaged and really fun and interactive. Cause uh, no, I think none of us wanna go out and see someone you know, sitting at a laptop and doing stuff. So, and I couldn't do that any in any case on any level so it has to still be an engagement with the tools but refined so we'll see how that unfolds but the question i had for you I don't, you kind of went by you but w before pandemic what did, was your community playing live did you have concerts out live yes 
-hmm. Yes, in, in my, my personal project, yes. Uh, okay. I was playing, I don't know, like each month in, in 2090, for example. Yeah. I oh, very cool. On the, on the solar eclipse uh, and nice. things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was very good. Of course, in different places. But right. yeah, I was playing live with, with many, most of, of, of my synthesizers that are heavy. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And delicate. And, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm, if I'm driving somewhere, you know, I have backups in, in my vehicle. So I have a, a second expander, second emu sampler, it's waiting there, you know, in the van. So there's always that, like the SoundQuest Fest with the backup server. I mean, when you're putting yourself out on the high wire like that, there's certain things and, and I've had them fail in the past at concerts and there's some certain instruments or, or there's so much based on that instrument that I can't take a chance. So there's that, that's that piece. But so that's a, again, the beauty of, of home. I know there's a lot of folks say, I can't wait to get out live again, but in the meantime, we're, we're just you know, doing everything we can to keep that alive here through the through this new streaming reality. So we'll, we'll see what happens next, but yeah. So um, my newest solo album is called uh, As It Is. It came out together with uh, an album, Temple of the Melting Dawn, who I mentioned um, that I created with Serena Gabriel as a duo, but uh, the, uh, as it is together, the, the two albums really just, they came out on the same day. And as it is really steps into the deep end of, of this realm, I feel like I'm really <clears throat> uncovering and exploring in a new way now, which is this, these harmonic forms and these structures that, um, that are in between the worlds. There's really a quality to this music that really started coming through with um, the Mercurius album. And if, if you don't know those albums, I'll make sure that you, you get a taste of those. But there's, there's, there's really this, this evolution of the non-rhythmic, of the textural, of the almost like a contemporary classic, uh, modern avant-garde kind of aspect in there with the harmonies I'm going for. And so it's, it's really, for me, a, a a significant album in my work over the last years as a composer and as a creator of the sounds themselves, because we know, and you know how you create the, the, the patches and you create the timbres and you create the sounds in the synthesizers themselves, for example, which is how I do, I mean, all of my sounds are, they're instruments that I've built by hand, really. I mean, it's how you describe it, even, even though you're programming, you're, you're constructing and building <clears throat> excuse me, new instruments. So it really speaks to this, this place that this music is emerging out of a, a, a whole palette of harmonic movement and a whole sense of, of space and time that is really suspended and creates this very powerful sense of, of connection and, and and um, while this, this sense of, of what we're living through right now, looking out and seeing this kind of sustained sense of this, the, one of the pieces equanimity really just, it's like this feeling of like when you see this huge storm happening out your window and it's all this going on, but you're looking at it from inside and you, and it's, and, and you don't hear anything from the storm. You just see all this movement. And you see all of that energy, but you're you're looking at it from a kind of a, a calm, detached state, and you're processing that process. So to me, that's kind of the place I've been in, in the in in that way for the last year since we've been you know locked down. Is that looking out and seeing that, but then seeing that turbulence and all this strange stuff happening. But beyond that, and through that, I'm seeing like this sustained sense of of as it is time. And, and, you know, because I, I see a great distance from my studio window and there's just that sustained calm, like a place we're going to return to eventually. That's the feeling I'm 
I'm really focusing on. And so the closing piece on the album is called Emerging and it was uh, actually co-composed with my wife, Linda Kohanov, and who um, she has a degree in music and um, played viola in, in orchestras for years and kind of let her musical, um, her musical passion go away for, for, for years as, because she's really been devoted to equine studies and has written five books on equine uh, human connection forces. So, it, um, and she was bringing me in for a piece that she was wanting to create on, on um, creating this, this kind of coherent sense of breathing together. So, it, in my, so we were tapping into my breathing cords and then that just bled into her like, well, I think I want to hear this. So I'm like realizing that she has this whole vision of this whole melodic movement that came in and then this counterpoint bass line. So before, you know, I even could realize that we had this incredible piece that we created together. And that uh, also is now a, a, a video uh, on YouTube that I'll send you the link for that's, that really, really captures that, I think this sense of hope and this sense of connection to each other on the planet and this sense of sustained beauty that we wanna stay connected to. So that was the, the, the closing piece on this album that's on Project Records as it is. So I just really wanted to share that, that piece and how that, that's another language and another voice that we've been talking about that really, um, it's, it's, I feel like one that's, that's uh, when you were asking early on about something, that, you know, significant moments in the music along the way, this one feels like it's one of those albums for me that it's, I, I keep trying to find the ways to express it, but it's really this quality of music that started with, especially with me curious and now on to as it is, it's like I'm, I'm reaching into a place that's even hard to explain with words. It's really about that place that I know that we as composers and artists, we know that it's, it's, it's sometimes it's very frustrating to try and describe these worlds that are so complex and so full of- It's very significant as well. Right. Like so, <laughs> so that uh, th this one here, this really came into a, a, a realm of its own. So uh, just that, that as it is place and you'll hear those sonorities in there and throughout all of the, throughout many years where there's like a, a great deal of suspension in the music, um, complex harmonic clouds and forms together that create something that there's just no way you can find the words for it. But there's a sense of deep recognition and it's almost like a nostalgia for a place that you haven't visited or seen yet, but you feel like you know it, but you're coming, you're emerging into it. So that's as it is. Uh, that release. Thank you. So, yeah. dear Steve, thank you so much for this. Thank you so so much for this interview. It was amazing. It was a lot of subject that we spent in more than an hour of really really interesting things that you say, and I think the people will enjoy it for years. So. Really appreciate it, Ulysses. Thank you so much. And so excited for you guys down there and building your scene and and now the boundaries of of our where we live are are certainly have always, you know, they've been lifted for years now in terms of internet and all that. But now with this whole new level of the electronic community connecting up and live streaming and you know, it'd be very cool to see uh you know, to see you guys with your label have a have a gathering that way and put something out like that. 